In your intro, if you would um, mention that people can get the audiobook, it's available in in the hardback, Kindle, and audiobook. People, okay. a lot of people are really enjoying the audiobook version. It's by a professional actor. He's so good. Oh, really? He's really good. Yeah, oh. I love his voice. Have you listened yet? I haven't listened yet. It's his John D. Lee is unbelievable. I mean, he's reading, you know, just the exact words of. The audio book is play right it. now play the best seller. That's the best seller. Of all of them. It's been for weeks now, it's been the number one new release in the general history of religion, not just uh, the church. Oh, really? Yeah, in fact, I'll look it up right now and show you if it's still that today. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, and first daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have Barbara Jones Brown and Richard Turley on the show. You know, it's been a while since Massacre at Mount Meadows came out, and now, some 15 years later, the sequel is out, Vengeance is Mine. This has been a highly anticipated book, and I think a game changer such as why do they conclude that Confessions of John D. Lee is not reliable? Was it written by John? We'll find out that question here in just a moment. We'll also talk about why the first trial was indeed a sham trial, but it's not for the reasons that we typically have been told over the years. Why is that? Uh, You know, I really think that uh, Vengeance is Mine is a game changer as we look at Mormon history, and they're here to tell us why. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I have two legends on the show today. (laughs) Barbara, you can be legend number one. Can you tell us who you are and where we are? My name is Barbara Jones Brown, and I am a co-author with this man, of Vengeance is Mine, The Mountain Meadows Massacre and Its Aftermath, and we are interviewing today in Salt Lake City, Utah. All right. And then Rick, this will be weird because we got two Ricks on the show. Richard, Rick, go ahead and tell us who you are. I am Richard E. Turley, Jr. I'm a retired historian for The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, that's funny that you said that because I hear you're working at the church office building. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you're retired. They're just not paying you. Is that right? I, I am retired, but I am still working. As you know, it's very difficult to make a workaholic stop. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Barbara, last time I talked to you, in fact, you've both been on the show. This is your third appearance. The first time we did it separately on uh, your first book. Barbara, why don't you tell us? What the, I guess technically you weren't an author, but you were an editor, right? Yes. Yeah, so I think the last time you and I spoke, um, Rick, what? well, we did one together, the two of us. Yeah, that was the second interview. The second interview. The first time, um, I was co-authoring Vengeance is Mine with Rick, but I had been content editor of the first book. So Okay. What was the name of the first book? The first book was Massacre at Mountain Meadows, and that was published in 2008, also by Oxford University Press. So you guys have been working together for like 20 years now, 18, right? 18 years. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> <laughs> the way I remember is uh, Rick hired me. I just found out my husband and I were expecting our daughter, who is now 17. And so I was just take 17, add one. That's how many years I've been working on Mountain Meadows. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So uh, th- this feels like, so you can look at your daughter and say, this is how. This is how much this. time. So she's yeah. a teenager now. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Late teens, no less. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm really excited. And Barbara, you're with Signature Books now. You were last time we talked to you were with the Mormon History Association. That's and it right. Was Rick's, Rick yeah. was announced his retirement, which he obviously reneged on. Michael Jordan, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. It took my father three efforts to finally retire. Bet Brett Favre, I guess. Yes. <laughs> he retired a few times too. Many people have. <laughs> Many times. <laughs> So tell us a little bit more about Signature Books. What what are you doing there? Sure. So I've been with Signature Books for about a year and a half. I'm company director. Um, I felt really honored to be hired to replace Gary Bergera, my predecessor, when he retired. Um, Signature has a long and storied history of publishing great books on Utah and Mormon history. And so just trying to carry on that legacy. And I'm really enjoying it and continuing to not only writing books as 
an author, but also it's a great pleasure to help other authors publish their books. Yeah, well, fantastic. So, Rick, when did you start writing Massacre at Mountain Meadows? That project started around 2000, 2001, something like that. And so I've been working on this set of books for about 23 years. Yeah. I published my first article on the Mount Meadows Massacre in 1992. Oh, wow. So I've been working on this pro- on this subject for more than 30 years. <laughs> wow. Well, I really want to focus more on the second book. People can go back and watch our first interviews uh, about the first one. But just kind of as a thumbnail sketch, um, Barbara, can you tell us what happened? What, what What is the Mountain Meadows Massacre? Because I know book two, we're going to dive into more of the, the trials and that sort of thing. So very briefly, on September 11th, 1857, a group of Mormon militiamen in southern Utah in a place called the Mountain Meadows massacred a, comp- a California-bound company of emigrants, uh, some 100 men, women, and children who are innocent of any kind of wrongdoing. And immediately afterwards, they began the cover-up, and that cover-up continued for generations. The purpose of our books is to get delve deep into the history, to try and learn what happened, and then share that knowledge with anyone who wants to learn about it. Yeah, yeah. And so I know even since the first book, Rick, um, you published those two red books along with Janice Johnson. I just interviewed her a couple of weeks ago. And um, tell us a little bit about the those two red books. I'll just call them that. You, you can tell what their real title is. Well, there are actually three books between the Massacre of Mount Meadows and Vengeance is Mine. The first one was a book of documents that Juanita Brooks had tried to get during the writing of her first book in 1950. And so we got access to those and then we made them publicly available by printing digital images of them for everybody to see. That was in 2009. Then about 2017, if I recall correctly the date, we published uh, Janice Johnson and Lejean Purcell Carruth and I published a two volume work through University of Oklahoma Press that consisted of the significant legal documents associated with John D. Lee and the eight other people who were indicted for their roles in the massacre. And in addition to that, we created a website, mountainmeadowsmassacre.org, that has several thousand additional documents on it. Now, why did we do that? Because in order to write Vengeance is Mine, we had to find sources that were reliable. And at first, it seemed that the trial transcripts for the trials of John D. Lee might be reliable, but we learned that they were not. The transcriptions of those from the shorthand were done, one by a Latter-day Saint who edited as much as 25%, and the other one by a, not the person who took the shorthand, but by his student who had a hard time reading it. And so he brought in the other man who did the editing on the first one to help him with the second one. So they were not reliable transcripts, and we had Lejean go through the original Pittman shorthand and transcribe the material so we had something that was rock solid to work with. And anyone can go see these trial transcripts um, at mountainmeadowsmassacre.org. And it's really remarkable. So you have them lined up, and so you can compare the different transcriptions and then look at the new ones made by Lejean Purcell Carruth, who has an expertise in understanding Pittman shorthand. So it's really remarkable. And again, anyone can see the entire all of these transcripts at that website. And if you can read Pittman shorthand, you can translate it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think like there's two people in the world that can do that, and Lejean <laughs> is one of them. So she spent years retranscribing those. And not only did she transcribe what had been transcribed previously, there were portions that had never been transcribed at all. Mm-hmm. So one reason that we could understand what really happened in the two trials is because we had documents nobody else had. Yeah, she also um, transcribed a journal by a young school teacher named Marion Shelton, who was living uh, with John D. Lee and his family in Harmony, and then later with Jacob Hamlin in the 1950s, early 1860s, 1850s, early 1860s. And so she transcribed his journal, so there's a lot of new information there. So we were able to find all kinds of new information thanks to Lejean and what she transcribed. Marion Shelton's journals were written in Deseret Alphabet. Which oh, really? Lejean can also read. Yes. <laughs> exactly. She can do it all. 
Yeah. I, I know I asked Lejean a few years ago. In fact, it was at Benchmark when you were doing the legal papers. Uh, I said, Lejean, can I, can I talk to you about Mountain Meadows? And she said it gave her PTSD and she didn't want to talk about it. I mean, because yeah. the story is a terrible story. I mean, it's just terrible. Um, so, but I'm going to get her one of these days. The one thing that she said to me a few weeks ago at Mormon History Association, <laughs> I like Brigham Young. And you don't hear that very much in the historians community very often. <laughs> yeah, she's transcribed um, all kinds of things for other historians as well, for Paul Reeve, right. um, his book, Religion of a Different Color, and and continues to... Well, and his new book. That his new book, yeah. yeah, that is co-authored with LaJean. So she's really remarkable what she's able to do. Yeah. We're indebted to her for our book. Definitely. I know Barbara... We had a conversation a few weeks ago, and it, a lot of people have relied on confessions of John D. Lee, and mm. you told me that you had relied on it until you found out it was unreliable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us why yeah. is confessions of John D. Lee unreliable? So, yeah, so the official title, it is John D. Lee's, it's, it's said to be John D. Lee's confessions, but the official title is Mormonism Unveiled. And for years, for generations, actually, historians have relied on that as having come from John D. Lee, written by John D. Lee. But in researching Volume 2, and again, this is where learning about the aftermath of an event can tell you so much about what happened before the event as well. But we found letters um, which showed that William Bishop, who was Lee's attorney, who was the editor of... <laughs> who published Mormonism Unveiled, he did not have, he only had up until 1848 was all that uh, Lee wrote before he was executed. And so he had a shorter confession that Lee had provided. So he took what he had through 1848, this shorter confession, and he, he says, if you just give me your journals, I'll try and use those and just make this story go. And so all of a sudden, you know, we realized people have been relying on this source for generations, and we can't anymore. It is not a primary source. It is a forgery published after Lee was um, executed. executed. And so we have relied on primary sources to get at what happened. And so only that shorter confession written by John D. Lee that was published in um, San Francisco, two San Francisco newspapers shortly after he was executed— we relied on that and then Lee's journals and other letters and so forth. But we do not cite Mormonism Unveiled. And really, any historian that does needs to understand that this is not a reliable source. It's not written by John D. Lee. Do you have anything to add? Well, just it, there's some of the content that's just on its face, a, a bald-faced lie if you know the facts. For example, Mormonism Unveiled asserts that Brigham Young collected all of John D. Lee's journals and had them destroyed. And that, of course, would stop anyone from looking for the journals and seeing if, in fact, the lawyer transcribed things correctly. Well, he put that in there because he didn't want anybody looking for the truth. Oh, how do we know that that's for the journals? How do we know that's wrong? Because we have correspondence from John D. Lee that it's at the Huntington Library in which he, he's talking with his lawyer, and the lawyer says, "Give me the journals." And then he writes to his family and says, "Collect all the journals and give them to this man." And in later years, Lee's journals are donated to the Huntington Library by descendants of William Bishop, who claimed they were destroyed by Brigham Young, and by the marshal who was aiding him at the time, a Marshal Nelson. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, and I know, Barbara, you said you had to rewrite, was it chapter four? Because you um, relied so on So chapter first? four of Vengeance is Mine, I relied on Mormonism Unveiled. Um, it's got some fantastic dialogue in there between... Isaac Haight, William Dame, John D. Lee, and others who uh, appear at the massacre site the morning after. And yeah, so I was citing Mormonism Unveiled. And then when we discovered these letters, I thought, oh, I can't use that anymore. So I went to the confession that we know that John D. Lee did write, that shorter one, and only used that to recreate that scene of what happened. And then other um, perpetrators who were also at the scene of the crime the next morning, they write a little bit about that. So, yeah, so I took out every reference that we had used in um, Vengeance is Mine out, every reference uh, to Mormonism and Belt out of Vengeance is Mine. You won't see it anywhere. Hmm. So I remember talking to Janice, and she said that, so William Bishop was John D. Lee's attorney, and then the pro the prosecutor for the second trial— was Sumner? 
Howard. Howard. Sumner, Sumner Howard. And so he had published John D. Lee's confession as well as William Bishop. Rick, can you talk a little bit about that? Why? Which one's more accurate? Well, this is what Barbara just said. You want to say more about that, Barbara? Oh, just really quickly. It's just those two shorter confessions is what I was referring to. But go ahead. And are those the Sumner ones? The so Sumner, Sumner Howard and William Bishop both published newspaper accounts in short proximity to each other. But then Bishop goes on to write this more elaborate book. And you can actually line up the statements in the earlier accounts and watch them grow into the book. Uh So something that is uncertain in the original statements suddenly become definitive and magnified in the book. I love that you're a lawyer and so that you've given this a legal look at at this. Um, It almost, well, we probably should stay in order and let's go with the first trial. Um, Because it seems like the two prosecutors worked against each other. (laughs) So the first trial ended at a hung jury. And I think, well, maybe I should tell the kind of the conventional wisdom before your book. Sure. The conventional wisdom was, we're going to get some Mormons on here. We're going to get some non-Mormons on here. That'll assure that Lee's not convicted. And then the second trial... Brigham Young basically said, we're going to throw John D. Lee through to the wolves because they got to convict somebody. So he'll kind of be the sacrificial lamb. Um, is that an appropriate story now after your book has been coming out? So what our book does is it goes beyond the storytelling that's been repeated from historian to historian to historian over time. We went back and looked at the original documents the, the myth over time was that Brigham Young decides in 1875 that there needs to be a scapegoat, and so he fingers John D. Lee, and then somehow behind the scenes, he or somebody else is manipulating the jury and, and it ends up with a hung jury, so Lee isn't convicted. That's the mythology for the first trial. The mythology for the second trial is Sumner Howard comes into town as a new prosecutor, and Brigham Young somehow or another negotiates with him to convict Lee in the second trial so long as that's the end of the prosecution and nothing else is done. That's the mythology that's been repeated now since you know the 1870s. The legal documents show something far more complex, and in my opinion, and I think Barbara's in, more interesting. How did John D. Lee get selected as the person who is tried in the first trial? It's not Brigham Young selecting him. What happens is that in 1874, a grand jury consisting of Latter-day Saints and others indicts nine people for their roles in the massacre. Of those nine, five are really important people, sort of the leaders and four are not. They issue warrants for all of them and they eventually end up getting five into custody. Well, the three most important people that they have in custody are three of the ringleaders and those are William Dame, Philip Klingensmith, and John D. Lee. They really wanted to go after William Dane because he was not only a militia major, but he was a stake president in Parowan, and they were particularly trying to tie this to church leadership. So there was a lot of value in going after him. He was the chief military officer in all of Southern Utah and a stake president. They had already made a plea deal with Klingon Smith, so they couldn't go after him. They've already said, you're going to walk. So the only person left was John D. Lee, and as prosecutors have done for generations, they went to... Lee, and they said, okay, if you will plea bargain with this and give us the goods on Dame, we'll let you walk too. So Lee sits down and writes a fairly thin confession, and he he gives them information about people who are not in custody, but nothing to really convict Dame. So at the end of it all, they look at it and say, not satisfactory. We're not going to give you uh, your walking papers. Instead, we're going to go after you. So that's how Lee was selected to be the person to be prosecuted in the first trial. Then what happens is that the prosecutors decide they don't really want to convict him in the first trial. Why not? Because in 1874, they had gone to Congress, and you have to understand their point of view. Their point of view is this. We came out to Utah expecting that with our federal appointment, we would get political power and economic power, and we'd rise in this new territory. When they got to Utah, they realized, well, that's impossible without the approval of Latter-day Saint leaders because they've the, the saints vote as a block. 
and their candidates are selected by the church leaders. So it's impossible to get any political power. So they went back to Congress in 1874 with a bill written by Robert Baskin that said, we're going to disenfranchise all Latter-day Saints and keep them from serving on juries. But when they got to Congress, Congress said that feels kind of un-American to disenfranchise this whole population of people who have been voting for, for years. So I'll tell you what, we're not going to disenfranchise them. We'll give you a watered-down version of the bill. You go to Utah and see if you can't make it work to do your work. And if it's not strong enough, then we'll try something more serious. So when they get this watered-down bill, they look at it and they go, this doesn't help us get political office. So we don't want to convict John D. Lee because if we do, they'll say, well, it's working just fine. So they deliberately throw the trial. They deliberately work it so that it is a hung jury. So it's not Latter-day Saint leaders working behind the scenes to try to control the jury. It's the prosecution deliberately throwing the trial. And I, can I just jump in sure, here? Please. So when, when Rick first hired me to start working on this project, the first thing, I don't know if you remember this, but the first thing you had me do was read through these trial transcripts by LaJean Carruth. And so I didn't know anything about this backstory or anything. I was kind of fresh to the story. And so I just started reading the trial transcripts just to kind of come up to speed. And the first trial, I was reading it, and I thought, they're, they're never even talking about John D. Lee. They keep talking about Brigham Young and his first or first counselor, um, George A. Smith. And I'm like, why aren't they trying to convict Lee? They're not. They're just going after these two men, these two other men who aren't even on trial, who haven't even been indicted. And so I, I thought, why on earth are they doing that? And then I came to realize it was very political. They're using it as a show trial. They don't care about getting a conviction for Lee. They just want to uh, convict Brigham Young and George A. Smith in the court of public opinion. So, And they're actually quite successful. If you look at the... Yeah. They have a lot of journalists at that first trial, including the Associated Press that had already been formed. It was there. And so you had these wire stories that were going out. And if you look at the post and and during the trial coverage, it's really, really negative towards Brigham Young and George A. Smith. And that's exactly what they wanted. They were trying to influence public opinion and influence Congress. They wanted to go back to Congress and say, look, these people don't deserve to govern themselves because they can't even convict an obvious murderer. And that's what happened. In 1875, after the hung jury, they go back to Congress and say, see, it didn't work. Give us tougher legislation. Congress doesn't buy it. And the administration sends out Sumner Howard as a new prosecutor to replace the politically connected ones. And Sumner Howard comes in and just basically does his job as a prosecutor. Yeah. And so he, he decides to accept an offer that Brigham Young had had on the table since 1859 to help bring witnesses into court. So he went to Brigham Young and said, you've been saying you bring witnesses. I need those witnesses. So Brigham Young tasked Daniel H. Wells with going out and finding these witnesses and bring them into court. When they came into court, finally you had some of Lee's co-conspirators who were in court testifying against him. And Eyewitnesses who actually saw Lee saw kill people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Lee was convicted. And then the story that that was supposed to be the end of it all, it's not true. Barbara and I have coming through the evidence have found that both Sumner Howard and the judge, Jacob Borman, we're working for years to try to get additional people convicted for their roles in the massacre. Okay. It just seems pretty mind boggling to me that this, the first trial was political showmanship mm -hmm. that, I mean, so you're basically saying, uh, the first, who was the first prosecutor? Robert Baskin. Robert Baskin. Robert Baskin. So Robert Baskin Carey. just wants to run for Congress. He wants to get political power. And he's using the trial as a means to he, gain political power in Utah. That's the whole reason? He wants to disenfranchise Latter-day Saints and, 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 as he describes it, break up the theocracy that still seems to exist somewhat. And Brigham Young is no longer the governor of Utah Territory, but he is called the governor of the people still. Like, the people still follow him. Um, and so he wants to break it up. And so by disenfranchising Mormons so they can't serve on juries, they can't vote, then you can have all kinds of non-LDS people run for and win office and break up what he perceives and so as he a can theocracy. Run for Congress or and governor or whatever and win. Yeah, he becomes mayor of Salt Lake City, actually, Robert oh, okay. Baskin. So okay. the, the irony is they, they do achieve their objective. But they just polygamy. don't achieve it with Mountain Meadows. They're trying to do two things simultaneously. They're trying to use Mountain Meadows because violence gets a lot of public attention, and they're trying to use plural marriage because that also got a lot of public attention. 
At the time of the John D. Lee first trial, they had just lost their key polygamy case. And so they're putting a lot of effort into violence, hoping that that will give them what they wanted. By the time they get to the end of the second trial, a short time later, Brigham Young dies. George A. Smith had died earlier. And so the political power of Mountain Meadows died with those two people for the prosecutors. So they shift all of their attention into prosecuting people who had plural marriage. That eventually leads to the heavy bills of the 1880s, the, you know, the Edmonds Act, Edmonds-Tucker Act. It eventually leads to the raid period and to the Wilford Woodruff Manifesto and to statehood in Utah. And as Barbara mentioned, Baskin becomes mayor and later a justice of the Utah Supreme Court. He makes up with the Latter-day Saints when they have a celebration of Brigham Young, Robert Baskin comes to that and praises Brigham Young. And really? it, he got he his says political some nice things about him. He yeah. says some really nice things. And, and and the Deseret News, when he dies, says nice things about him. About Baskin. So the, the political machinations eventually work for but, the liberal but, party. But through polygamy. But through polygamy. So through the anti-polygamy violence. legislation, Utah women who'd been voting since 1870, they lose their voting rights. And then um, Utah men, if they won't sign a pledge saying they do not practice polygamy or they will not support polygamy, if they will not sign that men, Mormon men can't vote. And so that's how they finally succeed in winning political power is through prosecuting polygamy rather than the Mountain Meadows Massacre. So unless you understand this Utah political background, you can't understand the trials. Yeah. And we explain it all in the book <laughs> <laughs> if people want to dive deeper. Well, and I know Janice, one of the things that she said that was kind of surprising to me, up until the first trial, there wasn't a lot of a blame on Brigham Young. And it was because of the first trial where the prosecutors were like, oh, well, we've got John D. Lee here, but really it's Brigham Young. He's the big fish we're trying to get that – they were able to turn public opinion so that it became a Brigham Young cover-up instead of no involvement by Brigham. Is that a true statement? Yeah. So what Janice is doing is Janice is tracking the popular press. Mm -hmm. And that is what happens in the popular press. Intriguingly, however, the London Times, which does not have, a, again, a dog in this political fight, they cover the trial. And at the conclusion, they say there's nothing that shows Brigham Young ordered this. And this is in 1875? I can't remember when the article was published. 70, I think it was 75. I, be, I believe that because I yeah. remember reading yeah. that and being after, like, wow. After the first trial. After the first yeah. trial. Because yeah, the, so, the first trial was in July of 1875. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Brigham Young is definitely concerned that it is being blamed on him. Um, as early as 1859, he submits an affidavit saying, I'm concerned that this thing is being blamed on me. I want this prosecuted and investigated so that the blame can be taken off my shoulders. And in fact, um, he turns himself in to be arrested and to stand trial. Um, that's a whole other story. That, it, But in 1859, this almost came to trial and prosecution. They had the names of 40 of the perpetrators. Federal investigators had found those. And uh, they, they were given to uh, federal prosecutors and federal judges. And it never came to trial in 59. But so back to your original question, Young is expressing in 1859 concern that he is being blamed for this. Okay. And in 1859, some people think that Brigham Young intended to control the process by having it done in the Utah courts that he could control. But he went to one of the documents that Lejean transcribed for us is a meeting between Brigham Young and the federal prosecutor in which he tells the federal prosecutor, no, you do it your way in your court. Just make sure that the trial is held close enough to where the events occurred that we can get witnesses. Yeah. So if it had worked the way Brigham Young wanted it to work in 1859, there would have been a full-blown trial in 1859, and many of the people who were suspected as being participants would have been on trial. Yeah. So it's because of these political machinations that happen again with John D. Lee trials in the 1870s. Uh, the same reasons in 1859, they don't want to prosecute it. They don't want Mormons. They don't want to show that Mormons can convict their own. They want to leave it unprosecuted and use uh, the Mount Meadows Massacre as a uh, whipping, what's the word? Political weapon. Political yeah. weapon. Yeah, there you go. So it's it's political all throughout, and the losers are the victims who never receive justice. Mm -hmm. The sad thing is, if it hadn't had political value in 1875, they probably would never would have gone after it as yeah. a 
as a case to prosecute Probably. 20 years, you know, 15, 18 yeah. years later. But if it hadn't been political in 1859, it probably would have been prosecuted yeah. in 59. Yeah. Hmm. So. And again, we dig into this really deeply in the book if, if people want to learn more. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Rick Turley and Barbara Jones Brown. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about what Juanita Brooks got wrong. But looking at some of her, uh, some of the things that she wrote about in footnotes that have become legend, some folklore, some family legends she recorded uh, have become legend now. And our book and also a recent article by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich have debunked uh, two of those things that she included as folklore. Do you want me to talk about them? I do. <laughs> Don't leave us on the edge there. Okay. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at gospeltangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on youtube.com slash gospeltangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom, and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, t-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.